A very good afternoon, one and all. Distinguished guests, honored participants, and esteemed audience present here today, I extend a warm welcome to everyone present here on behalf of Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai, to the third Justice G. A. Thakkar Memorial Lecture. It is an immense pleasure to have all of you here today as we come together to honor the legacy of a remarkable individual and engage in intellectual discourse. This memorial lecture series serves as a tribute to the late Justice G. A. Thakkar. His contributions have left a deep-rooted mark on our legal system and continue to inspire generations of legal professionals. The Justice G. A. Thakkar Memorial Lecture aims to foster meaningful dialogue on pressing legal and societal issues of current times and provides a platform for renowned scholars, jurists and experts to share their insights, knowledge and expertise with a diverse audience. The lecture series encourages critical thinking, intellectual exchange and exploration of innovative ideas that give clarity on the topics and can shape the future of our legal landscape. Today, we gather to commemorate Justice Tucker's legacy and engage in thought-provoking discussions on such a topic that is pertinent to our society. The significance of this event lies not only in the knowledge we gain, but also in the relationships we foster and the collect collective impact we can have. To, to this effect, we are graced today with the Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra as the esteemed speaker for the third Justice G.A. Thakkar Memorial Lecture. Justice Mishra is widely recognized for his profound legal expertise, in extensive experience and unwavering commitment to justice. Your Lordship will be addressing us on the topic of constitutional perspective of corporate social responsibility or CSR. This subject holds immense significance in our contemporary society where the role of corporations in contributing to social and environmental well-being is increasingly being recognized. We also have with us today senior advocate Nitin Thakkar sir, who has immensely supported us in this endeavor. Uh, he's encouraged us and inspired us. Our heart is filled with gratitude for Mrs. Mishra for being present here today with us on this occasion. Thank you, ma'am. Commencing the thought, Justice G.A. Thakkar Memorial Lecture, we will now proceed with the lighting of lamp, which symbolizes dispelling of darkness and ushering of knowledge and wisdom. I kindly request our Chief Guest, Honorable Justice Deepak Mishra, our Guest of Honor, Senior Advocate Nitin Thakkar, Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, Professor Dilip Uke, Respected Registrar Sir, Anil Professor Anil G. Varyat, and Mrs. Mishra to join us for lamp lighting ceremony and pray tribute. Ordinarily, they put some on water. Yeah. 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 
Thank you, sirs and ma'am. I request our honourable guests to be please seated on the dais. Thank you. Now it is time for us to acknowledge and honor our esteemed guests. I request our Vice Chancellor, sir, to facilitate your lordship, Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra, with a shawl, memento, and a gift. I request Vice Chancellor Sir to facilitate Senior Advocate Nitin Thakkarji with the gifts on behalf of MNLU. Can you tell me? I request our senior most female staff member, Neha Gamre Ma'am, to facilitate Mrs. Mishra. Thank you. So with, we have with us today Senior Advocate Nitin Thakkar sir, who is President of the Bombay Bar Association, the oldest association of lawyers and the inspiration behind this lecture series. I request sir to deliver the welcome address. Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra, former Chief Justice of India, Dr. Dilip Ukre, Vice Chancellor, Maharashtra National Law University, Dr. Anil Varaya, Minister, Maharashtra National Law University, uh, Mrs. Mishra, other faculty members of Maharashtra National Law University, esteemed invitees, students, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you all. It is gratifying to look around and see so many familiar faces. It is a pleasing welcome to what is, I know is going to be a great lecture today by an eminent jurist, Justice Deepak Mishra, former Chief Justice of India. On behalf of Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai, I welcome you and express our gratitude for having undertaken this trip to specially come here to deliver this lecture. Let me inform you all that after COVID, Chief Justice Mishra does not travel for walk to Mumbai. All his arbitrations are conducted online. He has, however, made an exception to come today. Sir, I again express my gratitude 
por el hecho de Por el hecho de Por el Third Justice G.A. Thakkar Memorial Lecture on the theme of Constitutional Perspective of Corporate Social Responsibility. Justice Misra does not need any introduction. He was 45th Chief Justice of India. His judgments are endeavored to create a dynamic environment in the most positive manner. During his term, several landmark verdicts were delivered, such as Right to Reputation, Online FIRs, Section 377 of IPC, Section 497 of IPC, Sabri Mala, Aadhaar, Live Streaming of Proceedings in Supreme Court. The list would be endless. Sir, thank you for accepting our invitation in the year. A few words about G.A. Chakkar and why this series in his memory. He was a self-made person. His father was having a provision store in Anjar Kutch, a backward district at that time. After he passed his metric, at that time it was metric and not assessor, his father wanted him to sit in the shop and he made him sit in the shop. So his principal, who he studied at Anand, came all the way from Anand to Anjar to persuade my grandfather that you must allow this boy to study because he is a brilliant student and he will be uh, something good in future if you allow him to study. So my grandfather made a condition that I will allow him to study provided I don't have to pay anything for his college fees. My father accepted the challenge and he gave tuitions to the class in which he was studying the other students of that very class, he was giving tuitions, and that's how he completed his law. He became a judge for a very brief period, but all through his professional life, he devoted a lot of time in the field of education. He was associated with schools in Mumbai and Kutch, and he would make it a point to speak to the school children from time to time. And especially at the time of beginning of the term, and he very much wanted girls to have education. I take a lot of inspiration from him. And Almighty has given me opportunity to associate myself with various educational institutions. I wanted to contribute and give back to the society. And hence the endowment in his memory to Maharashtra National Law University. The sole purpose is to benefit students. As he was essentially a commercial court lawyer, and Mr. Fali Nariman, a well known jurist, has given him a certificate of being a great commercial court judge, along with other stalwarts like Justice Tendolkar, Justice KT Desai, and Justice Sarkunde. Hence, the endowment is in commercial laws. MLU always thank me for this, but I want to request the Vice Chancellor and Registrar that what I have done is nothing, and I do not deserve any thanks. I welcome all the invitees and the principals of various colleges and students. I should not detain you any further as we all are eager to listen to the learned Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your words of wisdom. We don't need any introduction for our Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Dr. Dilip Uke. However, to those who may not be aware of his various academic and administrative roles, a small introduction for the same. Our VC sir has served as Professor and HOD, Department of Law, Pune University, Pro Vice Chancellor and Acting Vice Chancellor at SRTM University, Nanded, and Visiting Research Fellow at New South Wales University, Australia. He is an expert in jurisprudence, constitutional law, administrative law, and human rights. And his work in these fields is recognized not, in, not, not just nationally, but internationally as well. He has served on various high-level committees of UGC, NAD, UPSC, State Public Service Commissions, including judges selection panels. As a leader with a vision, he has made MNLU Mumbai one of the cherished universities within a very short span of time. I request Sir to present the presidential address.
chief guest of uh, today's program honorable chief justice uh, deepak mishra sir former chief justice of india the senior counsel and uh, the guide of maharashtra national law university mumbai advocate nitin de thakkar madam mishra professor dr anil variyat family members of uh, advocate thakkar sirs uh, nitin thakkar sir all the dignitaries present over here and dear participants a very good evening to all of you maharashtra national law university which was established in the year 2015 under the act of 2014 just a few days after we will celebrate our foundation day started with one section of bllb honors and few students of llm in this span of uh, now 8 years maharashtra national law university has grown up academically at national as well as international level today we have students of bllb honors in two sections llm and we have four llm one is regular llm and there one is llm in investment and security laws which sebi is the national institute of security markets the third one is llm program for executive wherein advocates at jjs who take an admission and fourth one is llm in corporate insolvency in association with bombay stock exchange we are also ma maharashtra national university mumbai is the only university not only in india but in whole asia which offers a masters program that is ma in mediation and conflict resolution along with that uh, from this academic year we are launching two mba programs as well as uh, we have near about 20 centers which offers almost 12 diploma courses in addition to that we have also phd programs right now rather the workshop on research methodology 10 days workshop on research methodology is underway is going on it was 2019 20th march 2019 precisely i remember so advocate nitin stakkar sir said that he didn't do anything he doesn't doesn't deserve anything any thanks from us there was a meeting you know called in this university itself in an adjoining hall just across this headed by then judge of the bombay high court now supreme court judge honorable justice abhay ho sir and after the conclusion of meeting he asked me to just propose the vote of thanks and i proposed the vote of thanks and not only vote of thanks i felt instantly that i must make some appeal because there were stalwarts from legal community legal fraternity and i said that this university is new it was 2019 this university is new but our government is supporting but there are limitations and if you want to grow and if you want to make maharashtra national university mumbai as a pride of mumbai as well as maharashtra as well as india i humbly appeal to all of you all of you in the sense then audience to support in whatever way instituting chairs creating endowments etc in this university so that we can conduct several such activities immediately thereafter advocate nitin thakkar sir came to us myself and justice abhay ho sir asking that what is the chair and how much is required for chair how much is required for endowment dear friends i am really happy and really grateful to advocate thakkar sir again and again that the trust of which he is a part ml just ml pen say trust at nagpur had instituted the chair in environmental law just ml pen say chair in the environmental law donating 2 crores to the university
and then again Thakkar sir has asked me what is an endowment and how much it is required for that advocate Thakkar sir has donated and created the endowment in his in the name of his illustrious father the justice G. G. A. Thakkar donating 20 lakhs moreover we did not have to say anything, we did not have to pursue anything, rather it was he who were after us that come and collect those checks. Today we are having Honorable Justice Mishra sir's lecture on corporate social responsibility. What Advocate Thakkar sir did then is the corporate social responsibility, we call it as a CSR. What Advocate Thakkar did then was an ISR. That is individual social responsibility. Sir, we are indeed grateful and on behalf of the university as well as all my colleagues and students, we express sincere thanks to you for generously donating this and under the chair as well as under the endowment, we are conducting several such activities and one is the lecture series. As you know, that uh, Honorable Justice Mishra sir is going to deliver a talk on constant perspectives of corporate social responsibility. I do not wish to commit any kind of a constitutional trespass about the subject. Dear friends, when Constitution, Indian Constitution, and primarily its preamble talks about Justice, social and economic justice. From that point of view, the corporate social responsibility assumes much of the significance. The private corporations, even, because it is the state which supports, impliedly or otherwise, providing land, electricity, water, and when they generate huge profit or some profit, it is also equally their responsibility to share that from the point of view of justice, economic justice, as well as Article 39 B and C of the Direct Principles of State Policy. The corporate social responsibility may be of economic in nature, may be philanthropic in nature, may be ethical in nature, wherein it is not only to help needy or the institutions or individuals, but while contributing in this development as a responsibility, social responsibility, corporations do get certain advantages and mileage in putting their own market. So it is a two-dimensional or maybe three-dimensional or maybe multi-dimensional perspective of corporate social responsibility which is there. As I have said that I do not wish to commit uh, any kind of a trespass. This is Mishra sir's uh, several uh, decisions are students of law. Majority of us or all of us have read, including some of the judgments wherein Honorable Sir has talked about transformative constitutionalism. So transformative constitutionalism and corporate social responsibility wherein the basic aim, basic object of CSR or corporate social responsibility is to transform the society, is to contribute into the social, societal as well as nation's development, nation's building and from that point of view, today's talk because as Thakkar sir has pointed out that the late uh, Justice G.A. Thakkar, who was a business corporate law person, corporate law man. We conduct uh, even moot courts in business law, corporate law, along with uh, other, other activities. And that's why it was Advocate Thakkar sir's initiative to decide and invite Honorable Justice uh, Deepak Mishra sir. Sir, on behalf of, uh, once again, Maharashtra National University as well as Advocate Thakkar sir and his family. Once again, I welcome you in hearing for this program and uh, thank you for having accepted our invitation and uh, look forward 
that uh, this is not the first and the only occasion wherein you are addressing us, but in future too, you will come and deliberate on various other aspects of various other topics. With this, I conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all the in-depth analysis that you've given us about the topic which we are going to cover now. So I request the program coordinator, Ms. Manisha Katyal, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. His Lordship Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Mishra was born on 3rd October 1953 and enrolled as an advocate on 14 February 1977 and practiced in constitutional, civil, criminal, revenue, service and sales tax matters in Orissa High Court and Service Tribunal. He was appointed as the additional judge of Orissa High Court on 17th January 1996 and transferred to Madhya Pradesh High Court on 3rd March 1997. He became the permanent judge on 19th December 1997. Uh, your Lordship assumed the charge of the Office of Chief Justice of Patna High Court on 23rd December 2009 and further the charge of the Office of Chief Justice of India on 24th March, uh, 24th May 2010. He was appointed as Chief Justice of India on 28th August 2017 and further retired on October 2, 2018. We thank you, sir, for being present here with us. I request your Lordship to proceed for third Justice G.A. Thakkar Memorial Lecture on the theme of constitutional perspective of CSR. Doctor, sir. Dr. Dilip Vike, the Vice Chancellor of Maharashtra National Law University, Mr. Nitin Thakkar, the Senior Counsel and a Senior Friend of Mine in a way, Professor Dr. Anil J. Bharyar, the family members of Black Justice G. A. Thakkar, the members of the faculty, my dear students, I would like to call them friends. Friends from the electronic and print media, ladies and gentlemen. Before I proceed with the lecture, it's my obligation to speak about my presence over here and Lev Justice J. Thakka. I must say, I am immensely delighted and extremely honored to deliver Tar Justice G. A. Thakka Memorial Lecture. Justice Thakka, as I have understood, was a man of great determination. His commitment to justice is quite well known in the legal circle. He had an exceptional career as a counsel because he purchased persuasive advocacy skills, deep understanding of law, meticulous analysis, 
and fearless presentation of cases in courts. He demonstrated his versatility and mastery over various branches of law. As I have been told, I didn't have the occasion to meet him. His courtroom presence commanded respect and his dedication to justice on the admiration from his colleagues. It's a great thing to earn admiration from colleagues. As a judge of the High Court of Bombay, Justice Thakur exercised his judicial powers with wisdom and devotion to serve the cause of justice. He exposited intellectual integrity and sincerity. His elements are marked by the depth of analysis, clarity of reasoning, and profound understanding of the underlying social and moral dimensions. Justice Thakur's unwavering commitment to ensure access to justice for all segments of the society dissolves social recognition. Throughout his career, he consistently advocated for the protection of the rights of the marginalized underprivileged and vulnerable population. It should be the collective responsibility to carry forward his vision of holding the principles of justice, equality, and fairness. And for this purpose, his son, Mr. Nitin Thakur, deserves to be congratulated, but not thanked. Right? He said, don't thank me. He was right. He was congratulating my friend. Presently, let me advert to the topic of the lecture, constitutional perspective of corporate social justice. It's a well-known social and philosophical idea that a concept that emerges with a box of time by the process of evolution and introduction of law has the potentiality and possibility of prior existence in a different form because of the affirmative perception of the collective value and wisdom. Starting from the Vedas to the Gita and others like Artha Shastra of Kautilya and Nitya Satakam of Hartuhari, there is reference to charity for good causes and to dissolving people for upliftment of the society. In Rig Veda, it has been said, and I quote, let the stronger man give to the man whose need is greater. Let him gaze upon the lengthening part of his life. Quote, Loka Sangraha, and Loka Kalyan are constantly mentioned as a duty and responsibility for the people who are in a position and capable to work for the collective. The Shastras prescribe the rule for the king to govern with care, concern, and dedication so that all the people would live in happiness. Loka, Samastha, 
सुखीनो अवंतो दैट वाज द सेम दस फ्रॉम द डेज ऑफ द एंशिएंट्स द कांसेप्ट्स ऑफ चैरिटी हेल्प एंड रिस्पांसिबिलिटी वर इंग्रेड आइदर इन धर्म in the classical sense of the term do not misunderstand me in any other way i said in the classical sense of the term or sanskar a big insegregable nexus with community interests in the early period of modern industrial civilization companies were considered as vehicles of doing business having financial interest there were certain undertakings which did some welfare work for the society it was an expression of philanthropic work for the people it was an attitude there was no obligation in a way i think nobody should mind it thinking of the ancestors promotion of goodwill distinct social identification and respectability those were the motives to do charity kindness and societal health it was voluntary it may be that they were inspired by the doctrine that economics should be friendly with ethics social good and not exclusively meant for profit nothing remains static few minutes back i was there now i am here but many people desire strongly that things must remain as they are they are for status quo time brings change in the social order and societal purpose now mark this sentence it is time that has the potentiality to body such conditions of thought in 1983 justice bhagwati in p r ramkrishnan said i am quoting few lines please understand this lines because they are spoken with seriousness and depth it began to be realized that the company is a species of social organization with a life and dynamics of its own and exercising a significant power in contemporary society the new concept of corporate responsibility transcending the limited traditional views about the relationship between management and shareholders the adoption of the socialistic pattern of society as the ultimate goal of the country's economic and social policies hasten the emergence of this new concept of the corporation the socio economic objects set out in part 4 of the constitution have since guided and shaped this new corporate <coughs> philosophy then the learned judge proceeds for the today social scientists and thinkers regard a company as a living vital and dynamic social organism with a firm and deep rooted with affiliation 
with the rest of community in which it functions. There was no guideline at that time in 1983. There was no statutory command. And the beauty of this decision is that Justice Bhagavati refers to a decision of 1950, Chiranjilal. And in Chiranjilal, the Supreme Court says, please carefully listen to the slides. 1950, we should bear in mind that a corporation which is engaged in production of a commodity vitally essential to the community has a social character of its own and it must not be regarded as the concern primarily or only of those who invest their money in it. Unquote. The key words are it has a social character of its own, 1950. Just a little bit. He refers to a statement which was evolved in Delhi Conference, where a company is called an enterprise is a citizen. An enterprise is a citizen. Like a citizen, it deemed and judged by its actions in relation to the community of which it's a member as well as by its economic performance. The court further added That is why it is regarded as one of the paramount objectives of the company to bring about maximization of social welfare and common good. Four years after, Justice Bhagavati, presiding over the Constitution bench, said, I quote, we may point out that this court has throughout the last few years expanded the horizon of Article 12 primarily to inject respect for human rights and social concerns in our corporate structure. You see, you read decisions, articles with regard to corporate social responsibility. Just one angle. Go in depth as students of law. Try to understand how it emerged, how the courts interpreted, how the thoughts emanated. In the absence of that, it becomes absolutely statistics. And law is not simple statistics. Law is understanding of social philosophy, concern for justice, social, political, economics, and the desire to frame legal propositions in a syllogistic manner. I, am, I was dealing with a matter as a member of the three judge bench in Anita Hara. Question arose whether a company should be a party to a proceeding under section 138 of the negotiable law, negotiable instruments act. I have the opportunity to state and I think that is what Everyone would say so. A company has a reputation. The purpose of saying this is that the commercial concerns and collective good 
have been recognized by the highest constitutional court and that there has been a transformation. When you talk about transformative constitutionalism, it's not that the only constitutional principles get transformed. No. The renaissance of the constitution spreads over the statutory interpretation when you view them with that kind of constitutional spectrum. Never narrow an interpretation. Broader the horizon, you are a better intellectual adventurist. Right? The understanding of corporate social responsibility ranges from simple ones to comprehensive ones. It encompasses a range of activities that demonstrate the responsibility and advocate for a holistic approach to social development and environmental sustainability. CSR is viewed as business committing to contribute to sustainable economic development by collaborating with employees, their families, local communities, and the society at large. An ethically responsible business should embrace legal, ethical, and philanthropic responsibility. I knew someone who was a great businessman in thirties. Of course, I met him in 1980. He said, business is bigness of heart. Largeness of mind. You can't ignore human qualities while doing business. Now, the number of lectures have been given human rights and business. But that gentleman told me, at the age of 18, they look, these are the qualities to become a big businessman. Let's go to the international level. At the international level, CSR has been actively promoted as a development model that provides an alternative to state intervention. It is seen as a way to express and address issues of governance involving individuals, groups, and companies who are stakeholders in the process. CSI is committed to grow and importance and gain significance in these years. During the Rio conference on environment, and sustainable development in 1992. The United Nations invited multinational enterprises to assume a commitment towards society and the environment by including in their commercial agreement provisions to protest and protect against the violation of human rights and also in books said the fundamental principles of basic human rights, workers' rights, and the environment in its own place. The CSR concept is also linked to the notion of sustainable de development defined by the Brundtland Commission in 1987. The Commission defined sustainable development as the pursuit of development that caters to the present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to fulfill their own needs. You see, there is a book on environment. It wants, it writes like this, one do not live on the borrowed time of your grandsons. To destroy the environment, 
destroy the forest, you will not suffer. Your grandson will suffer. And don't think that you will not marry. There have been numerous attempts at the international as well as national level to deal with impact of human rights of corporate activity through legal regulations. In 2011, UN guiding principles on business and human rights rest on three interrelated pillars. One, the state's duty to protect. Two, the corporate responsibility to respect. And three, access to remedy. The principles offer a common ground from which to begin the work of implementation as the emphasis was not more on creation of new international obligations, but in elaborating the implications of existing standards and practices for state and business and integrating them with a single, logically coherent and comprehensive template. It should be borne in mind that it would be an illusion to imagine a successful business when the society around it is self-failing. A prosperous and growing society, the sine qua non, for any business to succeed, and the reverse is equally true. That is the fulcrum. That is the bedrock. Unless you have a successful surrounding, you cannot do business. You cannot do business in a barren land. You cannot have garden in a land that cannot grow flowers. I'm, I'm telling it in a metaphorical sense. Corporate social responsibility, I've already told, has a legal legitimacy. One may at a first glance think that it was only voluntary statutory based, but on a deeper understanding, all of us would appreciate that it has a constitutional perspective and it is normatively connected with constitutional provisions, philosophy, and values. The nexus between the CSA and the Indian constitutional scheme emerges as a precursor for a glorious growth of both the Indian citizenry and Indian business. For there can be no thriving of Indian business unless there is simultaneous proportional prosperity of the populace. That is why I have ingrained this constitutional facet into this concept. You see, all of you read the constitution. Please read the preamble carefully. The preamble of the Constitution of India and the preambular goals set out therein conceived for the Indian corporations, which are <coughs> considered as legal juristic persons in the eye of law, strict and genuine adherence by their responsibility towards the citizens. The preamble of the Constitution was framed with great thought and deliberation. It reflects laudable and noble objectives which it strives to achieve by requiring every citizen, including the corporations, to abide by the Constitution and respect its 
ideas and institutions. Social justice, that is what the Vice Chancellor emphasized upon, which is enshrined in the preamble, has time and again been invoked by the constitutional courts to uphold the validity of the legislations aimed at removing economic inequalities, providing decent standard of living to workers and protect the weaker sections of the society. In 1998, one of my colleagues asked me, so nothing which is fundamental and constitutes a basic structure of the constitution can be amended. So right, then how could in 1976, the parliament introduce the term socialist in the preamble. Enhancing the constitutional goal or making the spine stronger, there is nothing wrong. You can always afford to have a supple spine. And socialist as a term enhances the strength of the spine of the constitution. By virtue of incorporation of this word, cast a duty on every citizen, on us. Never say I, never say you in the context of the constitution. I'm not talking about choice. I am not talking about privacy. I am not talking about the rights. I am talking about achieving the goal. We must use a collective way. And that is what these terms really convey. This is a reference with regard to directive principles of state policy. I read somewhere that this corporate social responsibility which has been incorporated in the Companies Act in 19, Companies Act of 1913. This is state's duty. The directive principles have been incorporated for the state for proper governance. Why put the load on the private sector? It's our constitution. What an interesting argument. To be noted, to be rejected. The judges said with quite familiarity, it is noted to be rejected. Why? Must be given reasons. Article 38.1 encapsulates the constitutional concern for human rights. And human rights is a constitutional right. And it requires the state to promote the welfare of the people. It lays stress on social and economic justice. It obliges the state to endeavor to minimize inequalities in income and eliminate inequities in facilities and opportunities among citizens. Similar is the objective of Article 39, which Italia enjoins the state to frame its policy in such a manner that it results in ensuring that there is no concentration of wealth and means and that the ownership and control of material resources are so distributed to best subserve the common good. Do not confuse it with distributive justice. You may lose track. Attempt has to be made for this. Article 42 lays down that the state shall make provisions to secure just and human conditions of work. 
Just connect this with Articles 1 and 25 of Universal Declaration of Human Rights that envision about equality, dignity of a human being, role of the state, and standard of adequate living. As directive principles of state policy to govern only for the state, as a leisure being, and nothing to do with corporate sector. We have to go back to 1983, that decision of Justice Bhagavad Gita. What he said, I quote, Our constitution has shown profound concern for the words and given them a pride of place in the neo-socio-economic order envisaged in the preamble and the directive principles of state policy. The preamble contains the profound declaration pregnant with meaning and hope for millions of peasants, workers, that India shall be a socialist democratic republic where Social and economic justice will inform all institutions of national life and there will be equality of status, an opportunity for all and every endeavor shall be made to promote fraternity ensuring the dignity of the individual. Any statutory scheme that meets the concept of social justice and conception of human rights cannot be regarded as constitutionally unsustainable or invalid. Therefore, the argument that why you base everything on the directive principles of state policy or the corporate social responsibility to get support from the constitution, the bedrock was made starting from 1950 to 1980 and thereafter a number of decisions. All of you know, because we have come to attend the lecture, definitely at least must have seen the chapter under the Companies Act and seven seen attached there, appended there, annexed there, use any word that suits you. It deals with setting homes for women, orphans, senior citizens. Eradicate hunger, poverty, malnutrition. Ensure environmental sustainability, protection of national heritage, education, and socio economic development for civil cause, civil tribe, and all this. Now, education and other things that have been mentioned, they gain support from Article 15, Article 16, Article 21, and 21A from Chapter 3, the Constitution. 21C has been interpreted in many a sphere that it cannot be not only negation of life, there has to be affirmative concepts ingrained into Article 21. I am not saying the individual rights now, but to live with the dignity. To live like a human being, not to have animal existence or just existence. And that is why the court has said it is the state as well as the private companies 
have the responsibility to see after all these aspects because they are under legal obligation to subserve the social justice. You see, I am as a student of law. I consider myself as a student of law. I hope all of you do that. The High Court of Bombay acknowledged the significance of CSA in the realm of healthcare in the public court on its own motion, wherein the Indian Medical Association, Vidarbha Hospitals Association, and the government were instructed to collaborate and establish a protocol aimed at enhancing the level of sanitation and hygiene with hospitals while so promoting awareness among, among physicians, patients, personnel, and other relevant parties. Inclusive, absolutely all inclusive. And I must say, I eat. I respect this decision of Bombay High Court, the student of the law, and I appreciate as a law researcher. And I presume all of you are doing it. I have already told you, time does not remain static. In 2021, the Supreme Court in Indian Social Action Forum led on that CSR funds in the context of environmental conservation have to be appropriately spent and the corporation should allocate a segment the CSR budget towards the restoration and purification of rivers. The directives aim to synchronize the endeavors with objectives of the directive principles of the state policy safeguarding the environment. The similar directions were also given in Lapas. I do not intend to repeat that. Now, there is an interesting facet. Education. The seven schedule says yes, corporate entities must spend on education. Article 21A talks about the right to have education up to a particular year in life. What is education? Gandhiji said, if you are literate, you are not educated. There is a great saying. I was really impressed by it. That's what I'm saying. It's by Felix E. Skelly. He says, true education makes for inequality. The inequality of individuality, the inequality of success, the glorious inequality of talent, the genius. I must explain this. You see, all of us are not equally talented. We do not have that kind of elephant child memory like others. We don't have the talent. We don't have the genius. But if you have the true education that makes up for all these inequalities, and that is why the corporate entities have been directed to make efforts to spring and spread on education. See, I'm compelled to say, otherwise why I am here? Yeah, I'm here. 
pause for a while when you say, that's the law of nature. There are some quarters who say that the Supreme Court has created innumerable rights on the foundation of Article 21 of the Constitution. I am hasten to say that while the unexpensive interpretation of Article 21 enhances the citizenry progress and achievement in a democracy. Unless such progressive interpretation is understood and respected, the whole thing may enter in mere existence and absurdity. I am sure um, who are students here? Please raise your hands. Okay. I am sure I am present here to express my indubitable attitude. I am sure my young friends are the filaments of future generation will guide the same, guard the respect of Article 21 and let there be many more rights be created taking aid of Article 21. And you, are, you people are going to do it in future. By arguing in law, in courts or otherwise, I can't predict the future. In a body polity like ours, where the constitution is the supreme fundamental law. Constitutional governance as a core concept is neither hypothetical nor an abstraction, but is real and concrete, which has the effect to steer and navigate the CSR models of Indian corporation. You see that nuclear plant, you must have heard from Nam Kolam, it came in Tamil Nadu. I was a part of that decision. A lot of things were spoken, are good. The court said, after holding it's all right, it's permissible in law. India needs a kind of electricity. How to sustain? In the court said, and I quote, NPCIL, in association with the district collector, durably should take steps to discharge NPCIL corporate social responsibilities in accordance with DPD guidelines, and there must be effective and proper monitoring and supervision of the various projects undertaken under CSR to the fullest benefit of the people who are residing in and around the place. Straight, direct, follow CSR. And how to follow? It's given there. You can get away from it. I was reading certain things. You see, all of us talk about uh, corporate uh, social responsibility. I've been a chairman of a jury with regard to CSR. Who is doing where? I came across a passage by Professor Dao Bata. I don't know how it's pronounced, but let's pronounce it this way. He says, please listen to each word of this. The term is a brilliant one. It means something, but not always the same thing to everybody. To some, it conveys the idea of legal responsibility or liability. To others, it means socially responsible behavior in an ethical sense. 
to still others, the meaning transmitted is that of responsible for in a puzzle more. Many simply equate it with charitable contributions. Some take it to mean social concerns and aware. Many of those who embrace it most fervently see it as a mere synonym for legitimacy in the context of belonging or being proper or valid. A few see it as a sort of fiduciary duty imposing higher standards of behavior on businessmen that on citizens at all. It doesn't define, it tells you how brilliant it is and how difficult it is. Really. Now, why I was thinking, why companies are competing nowadays? Who is going to get more acceptability with regard to CSR? It is indubitably a praiseworthy phenomenon, and it could not be out of place if it is treated as competition or social constitutionalism or social constitutionalism. I must conclude now. I would like to say that corporate social responsibility when approached from a constitutional perspective and human rights angle holds immense potential. Transparency Accountability and stakeholder management are crucial in ensuring the effectiveness of CSR initiatives and building trust with communities which we serve. Now there is a warning. Warning by Melvin King, a member of House of Lords and famous British economist. He says, Global market forces all sort, will sort out those companies that do not have sound corporate governance. There is a constitutional obligation, there is a statutory obligation, but there is also a market force. I'm thankful to you. You are being patient, decent. Nice and courteous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Lordship, for today's address. We are truly indebted for your words of wisdom and a thorough anatomy on the topic. And having the opportunity of holding mic in my hand and taking liberty to add my personal opinion that we are, in fact, extremely lucky to be present here today. It is truly an honor, Your Lordship. As Your Lordship pointed out, that charity is definitely in the DNA of Indians. And how with time we have, we have transcended it in the form of CSR, where the companies are now mandated to work towards this social and philosophical idea. We have definitely progressed leaps and bounds from having no guidelines in the year 1983 to where we are today. We thank your Lordship for throwing light on different case laws in this regard and also the opinions of diverse thinkers and researchers. Further, as members of legal fraternity and as forever students of law, we must keep in mind what your Lordship has mentioned, that our interpretation of law must always be broad and never narrow. And of course, Indian businesses can never thrive if the society does not grow with it. There is definitely a positive symbiotic relationship which the companies must ensure. Thank you once again, Your Lordship, for providing such an in-depth connection between Constitution and CSR and for the extensive research which covers all the latest arguments on this topic till date. Now, before I request our registrar, Professor 
Dr. Anilji Varyat sir to present vote of thanks. I am going to speak a few words about him. Yes. So he is a legal professional with about 35 years of experience which includes industry as well as academics. In his last more than two decades spent in academics, he has worked in different capacities including the principal of Asmita College of Law, Mumbai, Sandesh Law College, faculty in charge of SNDT Women's University Law School and professor and deputy director of Amity Law School, Mumbai. He was also the founding faculty of MNLU Mumbai and where he served, here he served as professor and HOD PG and also controller of examination and he is currently holding the charge of registrar. Now, as the registrar, along with our VC sir, he has been instrumental in transforming the university into one of the top sought-after NNUs in India. Currently, he is heading three different research centers and is also the vice chairman of Indian Society of Criminology. On our request, Anil sir, to address the esteemed lord. Most suspected chief guest, His Lordship, Honorable Justice Deva Gusaji, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Vini Mukesh, Sir, Sim Advocate, and our one of our mentors, Sim Nidhin, Nidhin Akarji. All the participants who have assembled here and uh, all those who are watching this program online, it is my privilege to express a formal vote of thanks. But I consider myself lucky to be associated with all the activities of uh, Justice A. Thakkar Foundation in Maharashtra National Law University right from the first lecture delivered by His Lordship Honorable Justice Sri Krishna, the Moot Court Competition, the National Conference, everything. This time, when we were planning to have the third lecture, and the own request, when His Lordship has conveyed the date of today as a convenient date, we had a challenge. The challenge is that our university is having holiday. We are having vacation now, and our students are not here. So, how to get the gathering? That was the Challenge even, even our Honorable Vice Chancellor has asked me from where we will get audience and even recently <laughs> was asked. I said it will come. Why? Because in 2018, one of my LLM students have come to me with his disruption topic. The topic was Social Legal Dimensions of Mr. Justice. Deepak Mishra judgment. To guide someone as a guy, I should also work them. I, I also work them. And after working up on the topic, reading his judgments, I developed a wish that I must at least once I should listen to his watch. So I was sure that. There will be thousands of people who share the same wish. That is what we see today here. And as you are aware, we have space constraints because we are operating from a rendered premises. So three days back, we had to close formally our online registrations. Then again, inquiries were coming. And we said, hey, don't worry, we will live stream it online. So that is how we accommodate it. And today is also a day for my personal selfish satisfaction also. So I like to express my deep sense of gratitude from the bottom of my heart on my personal behalf as well as on behalf of the Maharashtra National Law University in my family and also on behalf of all the participants who have joined us today. Lordship, we are extremely thankful to you.
and our honorable vice chancellor sir has already explained the contributions Nithinji Takradi has given to the university and my association with him lasts for more than 20 years and I as a junior advocate going to brief some matters to him when he was facing as senior counsel in uh, high court as well as BRT. And I am so happy that uh, again I get more opportunities to interact and associate with him. Sir, the entire Maharashtra National University in Mumbai is inducted to for all your support, guidance and mentorship. Thank, thank you very much. Eight years is a small period as far as a university is concerned. That to a national law university because we are a new entrant in the field where big players are already in the market. But in this small period of time, Emanuele Mumbai has become one of the most soft, sought after universities by the students. The recognition is by the stakeholders. The entire credit shall go to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Dilip Okesar, for his efficient leadership and guidance. Because I have first, since I am associated with the university right from its inception, I have seen the remarkable changes since he has brought in. So, this pro program is also is done with his blessings and his guidance. Thank you very much, sir, for all the support. And I acknowledge the presence of so many of our partners and well wishers including practicing lawyers, students from other law colleges, our own research scholars, principals, members of faculty, for example, Dr. Madhura, Dr. Suti, Subhangi Deshmukh, then Dr. Gurbet Sani, <clears throat> so many people, like uh, Dr. Raghi, who happened to be my student also, now he's at Brisbane Harbor College. So uh, it's not possible for me to name everyone. The Family Court Bar Association, the president and other office bearers, Sashinar and other office bearers are here. And so many advocates in the, from the nearby Bar Association. So, I will be failing if I do not mention each and everybody's name and thank them. But it's not possible. Therefore, I take this opportunity to thank all of you for all the support and uh, support and companionship you have given. Because it is your strength which takes us forward. And behind the success of every man, there is a woman, it is said, who sacrificed so many things for the success of the man. Sometimes they are given the acknowledgement, sometimes they have not been given. But when yesterday I went to receive his lordship in the airport, we have been fortunate to see Madam also along with. Then he made a small humble request that <coughs> Madam should also be here so that we will be able to uh, pray, uh, pay our respects to that. So, Madam, so much thanks for blessing and she for a kind presence. And I do not take much time. So, with these words, I once again thank each one of you for your kind support, cooperation and encouragement. And we look forward to you the same support in future also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anil sir, for your kind words. I, Tista Hans, on behalf of MNLU Mumbai, extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the organizers, sponsors and everyone involved in making this event a success. Your dedication and efforts have made it possible for us to come together and pay tribute to a remarkable legal luminary. With that, we would like to end today's lecture and request you all to proceed for high tea. Thank you, everyone. Project is light one karana.